a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding reality. reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this very, very cool episode, guys, we have Terry Tibondo come by and talk about his book, his six-volume textbook series, rather, A Citizen's Disclosure on UFOs and ETI. Now, he I say book because he wrote this as one large, over 3,600-page book, and then decided to break it up into a six-volume textbook series, which is fascinating. Guys, the... The amount of information in here is insane. It's so comprehensive. Now, of course, six textbooks worth of uh, UFO information could not be covered in this, and we will be having him back on. He's just an awesome dude. But in this one, we kind of touch a little bit on his uh, age five experience that he had, as well as a history of Nazi space program, as well as he has an ET reptilian guide, which is really interesting. Uh, And then breakaway civilizations, and we talk about everything in between, guys. This is a fascinating conversation. So again, all the ways to find him located in the show notes. Make sure that you guys check that out. While you guys are down there, check out expandingrealitypodcast.com there. We are expanding like crazy. So definitely get that link on your browser. So without any further ado, Terry Tibando. Why do Swedish warships have barcodes on the side of them? I do not know. So when they return back to port, they can Scandinavian. <laughs> Isn't that ridiculous? Very good. I, Very good. It's ridiculous and silly, and I love stuff like yes, that. Yes. So I like, let, I like silly humor, humor, and I love irreverent humor. Yeah, I've got, uh, I got it you all. Know, even though I'm somewhat a, a spiritual person, I don't mind jabbing, <laughs> you know, at a different uh, spiritual aspects. You got to. And this what's this is what makes you so well-rounded. So here we are welcoming to the show Terry Tibondo hanging out. We're going to talk about your work. We're going to talk about your books. You are such an incredible dude. Uh, you and I have already uh, connected over this, and I'm absolutely fascinated by what you've done for the UFO phenomena and the the team of us itself, the researchers, you have offered us something incredible. And so I cannot wait for my audience to get to know you here, sir. So if you don't mind, uh, for those that don't know too much about you, just let us know who you are, brother. Okay. Well, thank you, Brandon, for having me on your show. Really appreciate uh, the time and the opportunity to not only promote my books, but promote myself as well. Um, I've been involved in the UFO phenomena researching it, reading it, being uh, at lectures, hearing various um, guest speakers. I've actually hosted um, an event up in Vancouver back in September 9th, 2001 at the Simon Fraser University. And I had Dr. Stephen Greer, Dr. Carol Rosen, and uh, Alfred L. Weber, who has a a Jarrett jurisprudence um, degree and was a part of the Jimmy Carter administration. And uh, so I had these people up there as guest speakers, and we did the first disclosure event in Canada on the UFO phenomenon. I had all the media out there. I had the radio, TV, newspapers, um, very well publicized. We had about 500 people show up um at Simon Fraser for this um, event. And this was uh, a part of Dr. Stephen Greer's initial disclosure event that he did in Washington, D.C. back, I think it was in May 2001, at the press conference in Washington. And uh, he had all kinds of media, and he had about 20 firsthand disclosure witnesses there. So, these two people that I had, plus Dr. Greer, were part of those disclosure uh, witnesses. And essentially, they gave uh, presentations on their various aspects from their field of expertise at, as it related to the UFO phenomenon. And interestingly enough, the um, 
first hour went okay, and then they got jammed uh, by some type of uh, electronic signal that basically shut them down. But they were the people in the audience, and they had their own recording system, so they recorded all the um, the speeches and talks that were going on, and it was very successful. And they figured about somewhere between twenty five two hundred and fifty to maybe a half a billion people heard that uh, presentation. Yeah, that national so we club. So he Pretty went around through the States and up into Canada and over into Britain with this disclosure tour. And so my team in Vancouver got together and hosted it for him, and it went over very, very well. So that's part of what I do, which is the C5 as it is related to the C SETI movement, which is the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And as uh, Dr. Greer used to say, uh, this is not to be confused with FETI, which is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. They've got the billion dollar budget. We're operating on a shoestring. <laughs> and we have we have the ET encounters. So we're not waiting to hear the signal. We know they're here. And if you do the right things through a, 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 a various protocols of, of um, or modalities of communication, which is light signals and sound, meditation, you, you can establish contact. Anybody can do this. Yeah. And I, I write about this in, in my book. In... Um, in terms of my own personal experience, um, my first contact with ETs and my first sighting it came about when I was five years old. And my father was in the Royal Canadian Air Force at the time. We got transferred basically from Victoria out west here to North Bay, Ontario, and then into St. Jean's, Quebec. And then we moved over into England uh, at a Canadian air base that was there. And while in Quebec at St. Jean's, we lived on the military uh, base in some housing. And my mother and I went out for a walk one morning. It was cold. It was I think it was in a November uh, part of the month. And... Um, we were walking along, pushing my baby brother in a baby carriage. And I looked up and I saw this disc-shaped object suddenly come flying in, hover over a building. There must have been about 500 feet away, thereabouts. Perfectly disc-shaped with a dome on the top of Kapala. And it was dark underneath, but very bright or silverish on the top. And I said to my mother, what's that? And she looked up at it and she said, I don't know, I think it's an airplane. Now, I think that, that was what got me sort of interested was she really didn't know what it was, but she thought it was an airplane. And when she said that, the thing just took off. Now, this is a bit of a, an involved story and I, and I hope you know that your listeners will bear with it, but I'll try and keep it simple. And that is, um, in the first week we were there, my father uh, was having a baseball game with the other servicemen on the base. And he said to my brother and I, would you like to come down and watch me play baseball? So we said, sure, you know, Saturday, got nothing to do. Why not? So we went down there and we watched and we were the only two people <laughs> watching the baseball game amongst the servicemen. And we, we got bored very quickly. We started looking around. Now, you have to understand, I'm only five years old at this point. I'm a, I'm a twin. My brother is a twin, but we're fraternal. We're not identical. And so we're looking around. We see an aircraft on the tarmac. So we go running over towards it. And my, my father didn't miss us at all. He was too busy playing his game. And we came over to this strange-looking aircraft that had uh, a swastika or uh, an, you know a cross on it on the tail end and it was uh, had just two two wings on the front no no uh, rear rudders very large 
tail and a tiny little propeller on the front of it. And it had a nozzle on the back end, and we looked at this thing. We ran our hands over it, and it had a sort of a camouflage. I think it was either a green uh, camouflage or, or khaki camouflage paint job. We found that the canopy was open. It wasn't locked. So we flipped the canopy in, over, and we took t- turns getting in and sitting in the seat and playing with the joystick and whatnot. <laughs> And uh, we spent a good half hour, you know, climbing all over this aircraft, literally. And uh, I think as a five-year-old, you imagine yourself as a pilot, right? Now, to put this into perspective, the fact that we saw, I saw this UFO that was disc-shaped that reminded me of a Mexican sombrero hat. I uh, connected this up with our current activity with this airplane. Here's two five-year-olds who probably, if these were small ET beings watching us, they could easily relate to us being short statured. I don't know what what they were in in terms of when they when we saw the air uh, the their their craft. And then a day or two later, after that particular event. Uh, and this this aircraft is known as the Messerschmitt 163E Comet. It's the only rocket plane that existed at that time, and it flew during the Second World War. And it was when it did fly successfully, it was lethal, and it downed a number of large aircraft that flew over into Germany to. to on their bombing runs and basically it would take off it would drop its front wheels and take off and go straight up and they had to time this just correctly so that when the bombers were coming in range they would take up off and then dive down they would get up to speeds of 600 miles an hour and there wasn't any other aircraft that could deal with this and they by the time they get off a round of of, uh, return fire the plane was already gone and so if the German pilots were successful, they got two attack runs on the on the squadron that they were facing. Uh, normally, would, they would only get one if if their takeoff was too early. And but they, you know, when they made their attack run, they only have enough fuel to get back to the their airport. Now, the thing about this is that gave them fifteen or twenty minutes of flight time. And then they had to return. And if they ran out of fuel, the plane was designed as a glider. It could glide back in. It had, and it would glide sort of uh, nose up with the t- one uh, wheel on the tail end, uh, so that it basically would come in, touch down on that rear wheel, and then gently land on the 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 front of the fuselage of the of the craft. Now, that's a little history of the German technology. A couple of days later, after having uh, looked at this, I had ETs come into my bedroom. And I know you were five, but what what year was this for everybody else? 1953. Okay. This is before they were even talking about grays. Right. Okay. And I, I'll be honest with you that the term grays is rather racist. And in this day and age, when we're trying to be very sensitive to other cultures and labeling, what we're doing is transferring our prejudice over onto an alien species that we know nothing about. People say they know. In all my years of experience of encountering different ETs, not one of them has come up and said, Terry, we want to give you some information. Not one. The only information I ever got from them was keep up the good work. That was it. And I'm sure we're going to get to it. Then you obviously had other interactions, but there was no communication with them. that. No, no. Yeah. And and if there were, it's telepathic. Uh, Because, um, quite frankly, if they they know English, that's great. If they knew German, that would be great. Or any other language, that would be great. Because now you have a verbal communication. But in the... uh, Types of communication I had, it's all telepathic. It wasn't verbal. 
How did it appear uh, in your, not, was it words in your head or pictures and images and emotions? How it was, was it? like you talking to me. So that, you could hear that, basically English I could hear with words. a monologue. Okay. I could hear words, uh, not necessarily images. Um, I've actually communicated with uh, a reptilian type of ET that looked like a geiku lizard. And if you know what a geiku lizard looks like, it, it's like... Um, yellow with dark brown spots all over it. Yeah, and they come from the Draco constellation, right? That's the well, Draco. Well, that's what they claim, but there's no proof of it. Right? I mean, this is the thing, right? Everybody, you, that's, all that's of them the could point. be lying to you. Yeah. That's that's right. That, uh, and, it, you know, you have to understand something. And this We're going to get into this because it's all in my book. The problem here is given that we're still an immature species, we're at this point in our social, spiritual involvement, where we are moving out of adolescence and moving into mature adulthood. And because of that, they're not ETs being, we, we give them uh, the perspective that they're very intelligent, more so than we are, and perhaps more socially, spiritually, politically evolved than we are. And so why would they come here and tell us where they're from, knowing what we are right now, yeah. where we already have developed space travel. We've sent astronauts, cosmonauts, and and sent them to the moon, and, and we sent spacecraft out into the solar system to look at the planets and their, and their moons. And we have atomic weapons, lasers, scalar weapons, do you really think they're going to tell us and say, oh, yeah, we? I come from Draco, or I come from Zeta Reticuli? Yeah, that's because like Because we're going to be knocking go. on their door right. one day and saying, hi, you remember us? We like your planet. Can we, can we move in? Not likely. And we have to start rethinking our space exploration uh, imperative. Are we going to go out there and settle planets with humans on it? Or are we going to discover, which I believe there's a lot of intelligent life all over the place, even if it's just an amoeba hmm. or it's plant life or rudimentary animal life or even intelligence. And do you, if there's intelligence, do you think they're going to say, oh, yeah, come on in, you know, bring the, bring the family and the friends and, and set up shop. Oh, it didn't work out for the indigenous people here in the United States, so exactly, probably not. Exactly, and and any time uh, in like whether it's in Canada, United States, uh, Central America, or South America, when Europeans came over, they mistreated and segregated and uh, tried to wipe out the indigenous culture that was here, and like that's not the kind of attitude that we want to see going off into space. And we still have that mentality. We're like a virus. Unfortunately, until we grow up and mature, we're going to be a threat to any other uh, intelligent species. Now, the ones that are trying to reach out today through CE5 groups and what have you are trying to present the best of humanity that we're not just apes out of the tree and we're not running around with clubs and whatever uh, and we're not going to be harming you do we have an attitude of fight or flight response yes we do but we also have the the ability to reason and if we reason things out and approach it in a manner that says look I got to find out more about what it is, who who it is, what they want, why they're here, all the rest of it. Then we're starting to take a more rational approach to things. If we go out with guns blazing, tossing missiles, shooting with lasers, or using uh, high particle beams and scalar weapons, that's not a welcome sign. That's a sign with a big uh, notice saying, if you come to this planet, you take your life in your own hands because the host, uh, the inhabitants are hostile and aggressive and we have to prove otherwise and so and I've, I've gotten off my own original your experience but I'm trying to set up this picture that we have to look at this whole 
uh, phenomena. It's not just UAPs and UFOs. And UAP, UAPs, it's just another nomenclature for UFOs, and they know what these are. They're not unidentified. They're identified. They have been, they've known about this since the Second World War because they've been buzzed over uh, their own uh, ships, both um, Axis and Allied. They've uh, buzzed Allied and Axis aircraft, and both sides didn't know who these were. Now, there were some man-made craft flying around that were disc-shaped, and the Nazi uh, 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 aspect of Germany had those as a secret weapon. This is what uh, Hitler was always talking about, the Wunderwaffen. The Wunderweapon, yeah. Yeah, the secret, uh, very uh, highly advanced weapons that could end the war within a week. It could have, if he had the, the means to get it all out there. And these these are uh, Hanabu crap, which are disjected. They went through a, a number of various versions of this, from the Viril to the Hanabu, to a craft that were fairly large in size, and they did fly. And there are uh, photographs of them in flight with conventional aircraft in the background, whether they were German or uh, Allied aircraft. The thing is that not many people know, even up to this day and age, that the Germans had this. But the powers that be in the military and the intelligence agencies, whether it was in Britain, France, Russia, or um, in the United States, they knew that they had something there. And they knew they had missiles that could fly and hit London. And they knew that they were um, they had missiles ready to target New York in the States. And that they had Puda Monday where they were developing these rockets and other advanced aircraft. And, when, and, and the whole purpose of Operation Paperclip, which was the American uh, program to get, get into Germany before the Russians, get hold of all the technology, get hold of all the scientists, 1,500 Nazi scientists came back to the southwestern United States and set up the American space program, including some of this advanced stuff. And the whole thing behind this then is that uh, there was man-made craft that were that looked like flying saucers known as Hanabu or Hanabu 2. They went through one, two, and three and whatever. And you can see, you can Google this and you can find pictures and diagrams of this. The, they asked the Germans how they developed this. And they said, and I think one of the people they spoke, spoke to was Hermann o Oberth. And he said, we had help. And he said, from from whom? He said, from them, pointing upward. In other words, back in, I think it was 1936, there was a crash in the Black Forest in Bavaria of an unidentified craft. And the beings on board survived. And these are the beings that helped the German, the Nazi regime, develop the, the spacecraft. And, of course, from all of that, we've got all kinds of rumors of what allegedly they could do with this craft, um, that they allegedly went to the moon and set up a base and all the rest of it. Uh, but when they talk about who were the first people out in space, it wasn't the Americans. The Germans had people who went out into space, didn't necessarily survive the trip, but they sent them up there. Hmm. Uh, and they sent them up in conventional type rockets. The first photograph of the Earth was from a German Nazi photograph, uh, proving that they had developed that. They were testing subjects. Usually they were um, uh, Jewish pr prisoners to see what the effects of the vacuum of space would do on excessive heat, all kinds of really barbaric and cruel tests to find out what they what would happen to the human body a lot of that information went to the americans and it went to the to the russians and um the other nations like britain got some of some information canada got some information that's why we ended up with this aircraft the um measurement 163e comet 
in Canada, and I figured out how they got it there. They put it on, uh, they brought it over on a ship, put it on a barge, and there's a river that sails right by the airbase, and they unloaded it right from there onto the airbase. And that's why my brother and I were able to see this aircraft that we probably shouldn't have seen. Wow. Do you think Hellyer uh, found some of that out, and he was? That's why uh, he was so outspoken. I yeah, and now I'm going to tell you something. You have to understand that he had his own experiences, and he had his own thoughts, and he got information from the military. But Doctor Greer informed him about a lot of things that he didn't know about, and consequently, uh, a lot of his thinking up before he passed away came from that interview with Dr. Stephen Greer. However, uh, he got it from also a lot of other information. Myself, I, and I've met Paul Hell yet. I, uh, he's a very tall man. Um, I had to do my own digging and research into all of this information in order to pull out uh, what Greer kind of knows and what some of the other people out there know. And, uh, you know, some people say, well, how do you know it's, it's real or factual and all the rest of it? And I said, well, I, I look at the people who present it, look at their credentials, their respectability. Did they write a book? Was it well received? Did they have pertinent information in it? All of that. So I had to look for the best sources of information available in order to utilize that in writing my book. Now, I, I've been sitting on this information for years and years, and it wasn't until around 2009 that I began to say, I think I could write this book. I had no idea how big it was going to be. I, I figured it would be about two, maybe 300 pages, and that's what I was aiming for. And then suddenly it was four, 600, 1,000 pages, 1,800 pages, and I thought, where am I getting all this stuff, you know? And all of a sudden, it bloomed out into 3,600 pages. It was written as one book, and I had to break it up into six volumes, and they're big volumes. And you look in the back of my um, library, and those books on the bookshelf, the, the tallest ones are my books, and they're fairly thick. The thickest one is about two, two inches. And it weighs six and a half pounds. God. And a lot of them are, are, are like that, between five and six, six and a half pounds. Now, getting back to my story of, of how I met with ETs, they found me. I didn't go looking for them. <laughs> they found me. And I believed at that time that ETs, because we just came out of a war, and I was born in 1948, so... The war ended three years earlier. Roswell happened a year before I was born, maybe a year and a half almost. And all of a sudden, I get this encounter. And these beings that I saw, um, I would describe as short, ghost-like. Um, when I say that, like Casper the ghost. Like transparent. Oh. Well, I'm not transparent. They were solid. As, as, okay. as I look at you, that's how solid they are. Okay. However, what they, the impression they gave me was that they were ghosts, but like little men, and they moved right through the wall. So that apparitional aspect made me think of a ghost because – at that time, I was reading Casper the Ghost and things like that. And that's what reminded me about these beings. They were bright and luminous. They uh, appeared probably white, had very large eyes, like a human, not black wraparound eyelids. Do you remember what color? Uh, their eyes? Yeah. Uh, I would say that they may have been blue or they may have been brown, but but if you look at my eyes, you see a pupil, yeah, you see yeah. color. I look at your eyes, that, that's what that's what I saw, but much larger, probably two or three times the size. And their their height was probably like uh, possibly a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, right? Okay. 
And it came through the wall behind the bedroom door and it freaked me out. And I, I didn't know what I was looking at, uh, but they were coming right through the wall. And I called out for my mother. I was getting very panicky and feeling very upset that I had ghosts in my bedroom. <laughs> and um, she comes in and she said, what's going on? You know, and I said, there's little men behind the door. And she said, what? I said, there's little men behind the door. And she goes and looks at the, she says, there's nothing there. You're having a, a bad dream, a nightmare. And I said, but there, I saw them. They were there. They were coming right through the wall. And she just probably thought, what the hell is this kid saying? <laughs> you know? So she calms me down and she leaves the room. And um, my, my twin brother is sleeping off on my right side of his bed. And the youngest brother at the time um, was sleeping in a baby crib. He was only about maybe one year, one years old. So there was one room for the kids and then one room for the, uh, the adults. Uh, and this was the military housing uh, 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 that they gave us. And she leaves the room and damn, these things show up again. They're, they're right there. Now I'm really panicking. I'm screaming. I'm carrying on. I'm waking up the household. Uh, she comes running back in and it's, I can tell she's annoyed. And she says, what's going on? Why are you c carrying on? She said, they're back. And again, she takes another look and they're not there. So in between the time that I'm calling her, they move back through the wall. And she's saying, I think you're having a bad dream. There's absolutely nothing there. And uh, so she spends about five or 10 minutes settling me down. I think I woke up my brother's uh, obviously, my father must have been awakened by me, and and uh, but she she calms me down. She says, says, "Look, Christmas is not too far away. Think of all the the presents, the the nice presents you're going to get. Try to think of something positive, you know." And a very motherly female reaction to a situation, which is great. And she said, "Now I want you to dream something nice." No more crying, no more carrying on. <laughs> she she leaves. And I look and I don't see anything. And I thought, oh, okay, well, maybe I'm dreaming. Boom, the back. This is the third time. And this time, I'm mustering the courage not to yell and scream and carry on. And I'm watching these things and they're walking uh, uh, at, along the bottom of the bed and then up the side of the bed towards me. And I pull the covers over my head, thinking, that in a typical five-year-old logic, if I don't see them, right. they can't see me. They're not there. Also, T. Rex <laughs> logic. I'm to. I'm led to believe that's ty or Tyrannosaurus Rex logic as well. Yeah. Yeah. And and then I fell asleep. But there is something in the back of my mind that says that those covers came off me. Now I have no memory after that. Uh, was I um, abducted from the bedroom? Uh, I have, I can't say, I can't say. And in my mind, I wasn't abducted. However, when I woke up the next morning, of course, I was being teased by my, my brother and uh, my mother was saying, you just had a bad dream. And, but I had an inwardly knowing uh, that there was more to the universe than I realized that there was life in the universe besides us. And I was drawing pictures of stars and planets and rockets and things like that. And uh, and that's a lot for a five-year-old to, to suddenly start doing. So that was my first introduction to the phenomenon. Then throughout my life, I had para definite paranormal experiences that were not related to ufology, but they were interesting enough. Um, I've had some psychic ability off and on. It doesn't, it's not there when I want it, but when it does happen, it's unexpected and it suddenly happens. Um, I've had premonitions. I've had remote viewing where it was accurate. I've had uh, telepathic communication and with an individual, a friend of mine who's since passed away, and I asked him about it, and he, he tried to be cagey about it, but he said, no, I was thinking 
what you were telling me. Like whatever you were picking up, I wasn't saying anything. You, you, it, I was thinking it. Uh, and then I had that with an ET where, they, where I was trying to reach out. And the only thing I got from them was I was out in the field by myself, fiddling with my laser, trying to get it to work. And I saw this bright light go over and it said, keep up the good work. You heard, um, you felt in your head. I, I, in my head. That's what they said. Keep as up they flew by? Working, as they flew by. Damn. And uh, then when I had a remote view of this reptilian type of ET being, um, I was asking for an ET guide. Because Dr. Greer said, ask the ETs and see if they will act. One of them will act as your guide. So I did this and I saw this reptilian uh, being. Now, uh, if you give me a moment, I can show you a picture of that. Um, yeah, that sounds great. We'd love to see, see that. Uh, I have to do a share screen. Uh, share yes. Screen. yes. Okay, let me see if I can pull that up because um, I did open up my page on this. And uh, okay. Um, I don't know if this is going to show up or not. Um, yeah, so, uh, you do have the ability to share. As well. Yeah, I'm just. It's I'm fascinating. Just, I think it's so wild that it just drove by and uh, said, "Keep up the good work." Did it sound? Yeah, good? yeah, that was it. Uh, I I've got it on my screen, but I don't think. This minute, um, I have to. Oh, okay. There we go. Uh, I need to find that. So, uh, let's see. I want to share. Yeah. Cool. I think I just diminished you. <laughs> oh, it happens. Yeah, when you share, we go off to the side and we can see your desktop. Yeah. Um, okay. I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll show you a different link. Yeah, guys, uh, check the show notes for sure. His books are incredible. You just grabbed one. Um, it's amazing you could lift that by yourself. That's insane. I think it's no. massive. I don't know if that is coming through. If that's too close or too far. Oh yeah, your little yeah, the symbol on the side of your book. Yeah, that's it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. what I drew, and I showed that to Doctor Greer, and he um, he said, "Yeah, I've seen that type of being." So I got a confirmation that it wasn't just me imagining things. Huh. That was the ET being that I connected with. And I, I said to him, uh, I'm Terry Tabando. I'm here doing a, you know, C5 encounter with, with you people. I said, do you have a name? And he said, yes, HGN. And I, th I thought, HGN, that's an unusual name. <laughs> yeah. And it made no sense to me. Um, and I had to think about this. And I, you know, I wrote it down, HGN. And uh, he, he said he would be my guide, I guess, for, for the time that I was down there. And when I thought about this afterwards, maybe uh, it was because he was reptilian that I was mispronouncing the words or his name, and that I had to think of it in terms of a, a guttural reptilian type voice. Did you come up with one? Yes. Okay, let's have it. Onna. 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 Wow. It's HGN, right? Yeah. Um, now, it's interesting that some ETs will actually give their name. I haven't heard of anybody saying, Oh yeah, I come from that planet over beside the the star system Zeta Reticuli, or I come from the Lyra system, or I come from uh, Draconia, Alpha Centauri, or whatever. Uh, because I, I, as I said earlier, I don't think that they want us right now, given that we have the ability to um, reverse engineer some of their spacecraft that will travel as fast or faster than the speed of light and can reach their star system in no time. Uh, they don't want us showing up. And in many ways, we've been told that we're a quarantine species on this planet. Now, I can prove that both spiritually, and I can prove it both 
through uh, experience and and the experience of who we are as a species. And I write about this in the book. And I should say books. Yeah, I like how you call it the book because that's how you wrote it. But you that's just split it, it up for us. Right. Yeah, yeah that's and, incredible. And so when I wrote this, I, I immediately – I was only – I was 1,800 pages, and I said I sent uh, a note to Dr. Greer saying, well, I just finished, or I'm writing a book, and it's 1,800 pages, and he says, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you need to you pluralize know? that word, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He says, that's amazing. And, of course, uh, since I sent that information to him, I've written the other 1,800 pages to Jeez. it. And, and it took me two years to proofread everything that I had done and edited and all the rest of it. And even though I've done that uh, at least twice using different programs, um, I had to rely on my own knowledge of the English language and realize that there's a lot of Americanization of the English language that is really not the best way of writing English. It Say may what? be more abbreviated. But uh, I tend to favor the British and, and what the Canadians use. We, we use a little bit of both, you know, to try and communicate. But I can understand when the British say they spell program, it will be P-R-O-G-R-A-M-M-E. <laughs> Whereas we will drop the, the M and the E on the, on the end of that word. And so... When I was writing the book, I had to sort of look at it and how would how do I speak and how do I communicate so that people understand what I'm saying? And that's how I wrote the book. So if you pick it up, it would almost seem like somebody's talking to you, not yeah. just putting out a bunch of words, right? Yeah. And as I went through it, I came up with a lot of original thoughts and ideas that I don't know where they came from. I figured I had... An angel on one side and an ET on the other side. <laughs> and a reptilian ET over there back. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. You know, I mean, like there, you know, we're we're being visited by more than one or two species. Dr. Paul uh Paul Hellier, uh Hellier, I should say, uh said there was at least four. Uh I've heard of um up to fifty-six different species uh given by uh Cliff uh, Clifferson, I think, or Clifford. Yeah, and Craig, Sorry, Clifford. Craig Campobasio wrote a book, uh, Extraterrestrial Species Almanac, and we're going through it on the Expansive Insiders over here with a friend of mine, and it, there's hundreds in there. I mean, it's, it's yeah, a ton. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and I'm going to tell you something. You're going to get a lot of that cannot be proven. That's the problem. Uh, this is going to be uh, more anecdotal based on pers a personal perspective, and they're going to inject what they think. The, the, where they're from, what they're called, all the rest of it. I have yet to have one ET in the 69 years of my life, or at least experiencing, tell me who they are. We call ourselves da-da-da, you know. Uh, nobody's told me that, you know, and not that I'm not interested. So much of it is subjective, which is what I've found with this. And you you can absolutely agree with this, that, that no two real ex experiences are identically alike. Even people that get uh, abducted or contacted and brought onto the same UFO will have two completely different experiences, and they've reported this. So what's interesting is the subjectivity of the contact phenomena, and I think that's why it's, it's so pervasive, because it has to be so personal to you for you to get it. So maybe yes. some of these folks have experienced that. I, I have no idea. Now, I think it's also interesting because... It, proving my point here is what happened, what you experienced when you were five. Uh, you know, you were studying Casper, you're five years old, for God's sakes. And, you know, these bright beings about Casper's size with big eyes, human eyes. I mean, I'm just visualizing you visualizing Casper because that's what they want you to visualize. And so, again, it's very subjective. Some people see them as demons and angels. Some people interpret them as grays or like a myriad of things that Craig Campobasio got a hold of and were able to kind of say, hey, here's another thing. I experienced. And this is what's so fascinating about it. It seems like they're, they keep popping up all the time. We went, you know, from four to 11 to 300 in no time. It uh, seems. Yeah. I, I, I heard at one time 126 and now you're saying about 300. So it, it doesn't surprise me. And, you know, when I wrote my books, uh, I used um, a quote from the Baha'i faith uh, from um, the, the prophet Baha'u'llah. That's Baha'u'llah. 
And basically what he says, and he's the, the prophet and founder of the Baha'i faith for this day and age that we live in. Every age has a prophet of one kind or another that show up approximately every thousand years, there, give or take. And he's the, the most recent. And he said, know thou that for every fixed star, and by fixed star he means stable star, it hath its planets. And every planet hath its creatures whose number no man can compute. Now, what that says to me is that if the star system is not in a proto-state, and I, I've taken astronomy, that used to be my major at university. I did a, a lot of the uh, study of the sciences and math and physics and that sort of thing, and astronomy was my uh, my major. And what I understand is that a proto-star system is a newly formed system. Its, its sun is reaching a point of stabilization, but the planets are still swirling around the star uh, in the form of chunks and gases and particles and whatnot. And so they haven't coalesced into a bowl spherical shape. And when they finally do, and, and most of everything has settled, life begins to emerge in that star system. And it will appear on all planets or bodies within that system, whether it's moons or whether it is um, an actual planet, which then brings up the possibility that we may not know how it would have formed, what it will look like, Will it even resemble anything we are familiar with on Earth or go off in some other direction? It will evolve, and it will either have a very simplified life form. It may be plant. It may be uh, aquatic. It may be avial or uh, avian. It could be intelligent. We don't know. In fact, as we move out into the universe as a species exploring, we may encounter extraterrestrial life for which we will not even recognize. That is a problem. And one of the quotes I read, uh, and, and can be supported by science, and this comes from the Baha'i writings, is that in the element radium, which is a highly radioactive material, there is, uh, they have found life on it, microbes and bacteria. And uh, proving that even in those hostile conditions, life can emerge. Now, we know that this is termed uh, uh, exophile or Ex xenophile. Extremophile. Or extremophile. Yeah. And what that means is that it can live in adverse conditions that are adverse to us as humans, right? But they can survive, whether down at the bottom of the oceans or in the ice or Two or three hundred feet into the ground, life can exist there. Now, given that uh, statement that there's life on uh, radium, there is an abundance of radium in most stars. So that Connect the dots. Stars, stars have the life. Dots. Is that stars the... have life on it. Now. Do, do you think that that's where the life comes from, is the star itself? I do not know. I can't answer that question because I don't have enough information. But if stars are the basis from which all other life evolves from, I mean, the Egyptians worshipped the sun. Yeah. And they weren't talking about a spiritual sun, but a physical sun. Yeah. Uh, other uh, cultures had a similar belief. Now, it is possible that as life emanates out from, say, the star and forms planets as it cools and coalesces, that life will have developed. We, we, Carl Sagan said it best. We are star stuff. We are the stuff of stars, right? And therefore, that too is a, a, an agreement from science with a spiritual concept. Yeah. And so... It is very possible and conceivable that there's life on stable stars. 
but we, we, we may not know what it is. However, and again, this is some of my research, uh, NASA with its SOHO and stereo uh, satellites that orbit in around the sun and photographing the sun all the time and under various conditions and circumstances have found very, very large spacecraft around the sun. It's so crazy. So I had Mary Joyce on the show. She wrote a book, Spy in the Sky, and it's all about satellite photos. And one of the sections includes some that she has dubbed the Isis Palace and I believe the Phoenix as well. And they're these massive, I mean, they're like thousands of they're, miles. They're apart. actually planet-sized spacecraft. Yeah, yeah. And and the the interesting thing is some of them are, are what we would refer to as cube or Borg shape square. Some look like discs. Some look like... I can't even I mean, describe. Like a jelly, there's like a jellyfish various, one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and some with uh, various tubes and appendages on them. And interestingly enough, out around Saturn, they have photographed these yep. large spacecraft. And if you were to read uh, Norman Bergram's uh, book, The Ringmakers of Saturn. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I, I happen it. to have, Do you have a me? copy? I said, if you can find I download, it. I've downloaded a copy. <laughs> that's if one that's been on my list, that any listener can buy me that and send it to me. I would be, I would love that. Uh, it's, it's worth a couple of thousand dollars. Yeah, I know, right? And yeah, and if you could find uh, yeah, one, yeah. it's insane. So it's called <laughs> but, The Ringmakers of Saturn. I'm fascinated by and it. It's only about 150 pages, if that. But it's got a lot of interesting information, as yes. well as NASA photographs. And it yes. shows two large spacecraft actually forming the ring yeah, of Saturn, yeah, yeah. Or at least part of it, because part of the ring is sort of cut off. And you see these two things off on one side, and it looks like they're putting spraying out something yeah. into it to form a ring. Now, again, this Norman Bergram is a, um, a genius photographic analyst who worked for NASA. So... If you work for NASA, they, they know this guy is legit and on the up and up. And that was his interpretation based on what he saw in the in the photographs. It's no different than when um, you're a, a country going, flying, say, during the war, or even now, flying over another country, and, you ha and you're photographing what's on the ground. You have to be able to interpret what you're seeing, mm -hmm. even if it's fake. You have to know the difference between fake and real. And and that's why the sophistication of photography isn't just click, click, click. It's they're sending, they're taking photographs in ultraviolet and infrared and other uh, ranges that will pick up whether or not that's a solid object or whether it is uh, an inflated object or whatever. So the thing is, when somebody tells you that this is what they're seeing, uh, out in space, uh, and it appears to be forming the rings of Saturn, then it calls into question, well, I thought they were all natural particles that are just, you know, like from an, uh, uh, a moon that never formed, and it's just whizzing around the, the planet, right? But scientists say, well, it's made up of ice and, and rock, small rock, right? And that the largest might be the size of a house, Something like that. So, I mean, uh, I don't know how they get that interpretation, but somehow they do. The Cassini space probe has photographed that, and it's shown that there's probably at least 100 different rings within each ring going closer towards the, the center, and then there's a boundary where there is nothing there but the planet. And... Uh, and that the rings extend out further than they realize from the planet. It actually goes out uh, maybe two or three times further out. And when they photograph back, you can start to see these other rings that they didn't know existed that were there. Wow. So this this is this is where true uh, science from NASA comes into play, which is then something that uh, is very credible and and. Uh, is is um, worthy of disclosure and and uh, informing the public about it, it advances science, particularly astronomy. So I have some of that in one of my books. 
Um, and as I say, I downloaded that book off of the internet. <laughs> it's incredible. Well, yeah. and, and I do want to point out here, I do have a question about that, but I do want to point out here that you did um, let me in on volume one here, and it's fascinating. I, I didn't know that there were so many different of uh, the Colombian planes, the little uh, artifacts that were found, little golden ones with the aft wing in the back that resemble modern day aircraft. I thought there was just the one and they made or a handful of them. The picture you have in there has dozens of these things. They were all over the place, which is fascinating. Yeah. So uh, to the rings again and to these uh, huge ships that we're seeing, this is my question. Do you think that they're exclusively ships or do you think that it's the potential for some of these things to be entities or beings themselves? Well, Norman Bergram says that uh, we have to uh, get past this concept of, um, of size. <laughs> Yes. And, and by that, uh, I suspect there are things so gigantic in size, particularly life form out in space, that we would appear as an insect or uh, an amoeba. Our planet uh, may appear that way to these things. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, you know, when you look when you look at the microverse, which is atoms and electrons, and protons, and then the deeper in the, the equation, the um uh, the the um, what do you call? It? I, I was going to use quasars, but that's the other direction. Uh, upness, downness, strangeness—all these things that are subatomic, right? Very, very small. And the point is that there is no end to the microverse. No matter how much you could shrink down or photograph, it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. That's just the nature of reality. You go in the opposite extreme, and what we see in our own uh, solar system is planets bigger than the Earth. And we see our sun that is really huge. Then we move outside and we look at other stars. And our stars, uh, our star compared to some of the others, like uh, I think it's Cygnus Y or something like that, Cygni Y, is so huge, our sun would look like a speck. Yeah. I've seen and that when they you, when they do the one next to ours and then they zoom out and they scale everything up uh, and they leave ours there and I'm like oh it's sad it, it's yeah. it's mind blowing man it's called the scale of ten and what it is and you can go you can download that it's on YouTube it's whatever you can you can find it and what's interesting is that if you were to take a, a commercial jet and fly around say the largest sun uh, or star that they have found so far. It would take you nearly a thousand years to get around it Jeez. once. Now that's just that traveling at say uh, maybe 700, 900 miles an hour. That's how long it would take you. I came up with something that I think even astronomy hasn't yet acknowledged, uh, and I'm putting it out there, and I'm putting my head on the chopping block when I say this: that there are stars so large in size, and they're closer towards the center of most galaxies, that they are literally light years in size. Yeah, that's- In other words, mind. between five to 10 to maybe 50 or 100 light years in size. Now, when you look towards the center of the galaxy, you wouldn't necessarily see that at all. One of the problems is it's very, very bright at the center. And yet, scientists will say that at every uh, center is a black hole and that it sucks in matter. Well, then there's a bit of a disconnect here, and I'm still trying to figure this out, even though I took astronomy and physics and all the rest of it. If you have a black hole and it sucks in material, then how can it be bright? In other words, um, if there's a, a void in space, that sucks in material, stars, whatever else, then conversely or obviously on the other side of the coin, there has to be a region in space where there's just a massive explosion or a massive brightness appearing, which is the birth of something. Now, there is the birth of stars, and they, they can tell that. There is the birth of, of uh, cloud dust and whatnot. They know that. So... The yin and the yang is a possibility in, uh, in astronomy. However, even though they said they photographed a black hole, 
I'm still scratching my head over it. Um, I haven't said it doesn't exist, but I need a lot more proof than just a photograph or that uh, Stephen Hawking said that this is a black hole. Um, because you have to have something on the other end of the spectrum uh, of that in order to... It, it, the universe has to be in balance. It can't be just sucking stuff out of, out of existence yeah, if it isn't yeah. putting something back into existence. It can be created or destroyed, right? Right. Yeah. That's it. And, that, and, and that's the basic uh, law of, of, of physics. That you can neither uh, create nor destroy, and that what you can do is 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 transis- transition or change it from one thing to another. But in fact, scientists do agree that all material physical reality is nothing more than energy. So when we look at each other, what are we seeing? We're seeing through organs and and uh, through sensory organs that there's something there. But it's very limited. And somebody says, what we see is is like a tiny spectrum of reality. And, and that's a good analogy, because when we look at the spectrum of light, you got this section in the middle that has color. And that's what we pick up. We can't see the infrared. We cannot see the ultraviolet. We cannot see radio waves or, or the X-rays and gamma rays and all the other. But we can photograph those or we can pick up on those energies with instruments. And it will be the same thing. It's like how small is small. It wasn't until we developed the electron microscope could we see right down to uh, a molecule and even an atom. And they've actually done now experiments where they can write on an atom so a, a word or two. What did they write? Oh, I don't know. Although, they, or they can line up the atoms to spell out a word. Uh, that's <laughs> I mean, cool. it's crazy, absolutely crazy what they what science can do. But if they can, if we can do that, imagine an intelligence out there that can have spaceships so large that they can literally move at least uh, small planets or moons around and put them into orbit or or not, which also now begs this other question. Is our moon an artificial satellite or is it natural? (laughs) And you, you, you read my mind on, I mean, that's the question, right? (laughs) And then you think about rogue planets and all kinds of things like that. And maybe that, one of the planets they drug off, they just kind of wait for it to all die off after a few thousand years of dragging it for a while, and then they send the team in to hollow it out and get to work, you know, and then put it in our orbit. Who, I love, to, I love who, the hollow moon know? stuff. You know, I mean, like, that there is as good as any out there. However, yeah. what's interesting in our own human history, there are cultures that said there was a time when the moon did not exist. Yeah. yeah. And they figured that was roughly around thirteen to 15,000 years ago. Uh, up until that point, beyond beyond that time, there was no moon, which means that the moon's been there for maybe 15,000, I will even say 20,000 years. Which also calls in the, the, the question, our dependency on it, and the life on this planet's dependency on it. Because every time you talk about the moon, oh, we got to have it, or the life would just end on this, it controls the tides and all that stuff, and... Uh, well, there's a lot of cultures that were able to scribble down or chisel into something that they'd live for quite a while just fine without the moon. So that, that'd yeah. be the question I would ask. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 now, and so when you start to look at the moon, like the, there's an interesting crater on the moon called Orientalis. And when you look at it, it is a crater that has like three concentric rings to it. Now, the interesting thing about it, and it's a massive, it's probably the largest crater on the moon and it's most of it is on the side that we can't see um but what's interesting is you go to the other moons like uh particularly in around saturn there's at least four moons that basically i call the cookie cutter moons they all look the same they all got this large crater on it that is at least three uh, levels of cratering within it which and according to norman bergram he said that these giant spacecraft that are so large have like these long extension tubes that come out and they kind of go and they can pick up the moon and start to move it. Uh, 
And now, is that a possibility? I can't say. I don't have the science. But he's saying that's what he thinks is happening. And that's why they all got similar markings on the side of their, at least on one side of, of their, uh, their sphere. And then you look at our moon, and we got it similar. Now, the difference is when you look at all the moons and you compare them in terms of uh, size to planet ratio, most of the moons are like 0.0025% of the size of the planet. Ours is 0.25 the size of our planet. Yep. Very unusual to have a planet that's a quarter the size of our own planet. And it's ideal because it allows it to be eclipsed by the sun or, or that we can eclipse the moon and, and that sort of thing. And the interaction, as you stated, of the tidal action and uh, all of those things that come into being. And if the moon is artificial and was brought here by who knows where, then uh, somebody knew something about the planet and what this would do or not do to it. And I'll, I'm, I'm going down a, a field, like I, I haven't even touched my first book yet. I'm just giving you generalized information. We'll get into it. Uh, hopefully we've got a lot of time. Uh, but when you look at the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, it's made up of a lot of material. And people said, there's so much material there, there has to be another, there must have been another planet there. And that is the remnants of it. Tom Vian Flandon uh, speculated and uh, hypothesized that this is the exploded planet theory, that there was a planet five or planet D or whatever you want to call it. Some people say, well, that was Marduk, Marduk uh, yeah. according to Zachariah Sitchin. Yeah. And, <clears throat> and whatever name it was given, there seems to be a reality that it was there. Now, interestingly, interestingly enough, within that asteroid belt are two moons that are perfectly spherical, one more so than the other, Ceres and Vesta. And when you look at Ceres, um, that's C-E-R-E-S and Vesta, uh, they're, they're uh, about, I think it's five or 600 kilometers in size, roughly. And Vesta has a surface on it, um, not too dissimilar to our moon, but it also has uh, features like a large, what they call cryo-volcanic cryo area, a large pimple, as you would, would explain it. And I spotted that the first time they brought out the the, uh, the NASA photographs, because I was watching this, and I thought, oh, there's something odd about that. And I, I, I slowed it down and looked at it, blew it up, and, looked, and I realized I was looking at a mountain that was that stands out like, like a sore thumb. On, on this moon or what they call a giant asteroid. No, it's not an asteroid. It's a moon is what it is. Science and NASA have yet to figure this out. But I'm looking at what I say is obvious. Uh, when you have asteroids uh, flying around, they're all irregular shapes. And they don't necessarily uh, form into round coalesced spheres. you got at least two of them. Vesta is a little more jagged, but it's still spherical. But there's something on the one side of Ceres that is very bright and luminous, even when it's in the dark, which means it's not getting any solar radiation or light hitting from... If the light is coming in from this side, on the other side is the brightness which means how can it be bright on one side when there's no light there? It can't be a reflection. It's called an albedo. An albedo like we, when we look at the moon, we say it has an albedo uh, number of XX, whatever. When they look at this, this brightness on this side has a, an albedo that should not even register. So that means there's something there that's very bright. And they're saying, well, there's probably another type of cryovolcanic um, uh, anomaly, which is made up of ice. So a cryo uh, 
a volcano is, is an ice volcano. But even if that were true, you still would not, would not see it because you need to have light reflecting off it. And where is that light coming from? So when you finally get pictures showing that crater, you start to see structure within that crater that, in my opinion, is artificial. Uh, but again, you get the people on the other side of the coin saying, I don't think so. I think this is all natural. You know, it's like saying, well, the face on Mars is just a natural phenomena of light and shadow. No, the European Space Agency has flown over it and they said, that's a face. That's not natural. And then when you got pyramids nearby, again, that's not natural. Well, then they're saying, well, how do you explain the pyramids of finding in the Antarctic? You know, we still don't know whether they are mountains or whether they are pyramids. Until we get past the ice, we'll be able to know for a certainty. So the, the educated speculation is that, that that's a pyramid. Well, if you're going to give that kind of educated uh, opinion about something that's covered with ice, why is it that you cannot give an educated opinion about what's there that's not covered with ice? Yeah, it's a perfectly right? good question to ask, yeah. Right. So in, in other words, if you don't ask the right question, you're not going to get the right answer. And I always say, uh, and I, I write about this in the book, people need to ask the hard questions. When you start to ask the hard questions, it isn't like, is there, but rather, what is there not? Yes. Yes. In other words, if you played Clue, that game board, asking, uh, getting an answer will tell you something. But if you don't uh, sort of not ask the question, that also reveals information. Right. And what I found is when I played that game, I'll always win it every time because I figured out the strategy of playing the game, which is ask the question and then look at what's not being answered and then find out who is not answering, yeah. right? And then yeah. you figure it out. So it's the same thing. And it's the same way in any good detective agency or police work. You got to know not just what you're asking, but what you're not asking and how people are responding to it or not responding. Yeah, it's just like whenever you hear them talk about uh, the alien uh, spaceships that they've seen, sort of the Nimitz thing. And by they, I mean the military on the news, which is how it's been phrased, which is something I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, then yeah. they're always talking about that they don't think that they're a threat. They're not saying that they're not real or that they don't know what they are. They're saying that they don't think they're a threat. So, you know, take take whatever you want from that, but it doesn't mean that they don't exist or that they don't know what they are. You know what I mean? It's yeah. the same, yeah. same to your point, same to exactly what you're saying. Well, yeah. Okay, let's let's let's, let's touch on that. Uh, I have my own perceptions of this, and that is, <clears throat> we know since Roswell, nineteen forty-seven, that they've been reverse engineering alien spacecraft. If we look at the Gerardo um, incident of nineteen forty-one or forty-two. The, that craft that came down where they saw a body and a minister came out and gave a final right blessing over the body, um, then they knew that even before the war ended, they were already dealing with extraterrestrial spacecraft. So for the military to say, we don't know what they are, is a bold-faced lie. They know exactly what they are. They don't want to come out and tell you, because we're not capable of being rational and mature enough to handle the information. You cannot handle the truth, as it was said in A Few Good Men. We're, we're not capable of going to a football game together without somebody getting stabbed in the parking lot for wearing the wrong color jersey. So I, I don't know. disagree with the sentiment, to be honest with you. Yeah, and I, yeah. I also want to ask you something to that, but please continue. Yeah, okay. So the thing is, some of us can handle the truth. There are others that can't handle the truth. Why? Because they're stuck on old paradigms of thinking. And until they get past that, they're always, it's like being stuck in grade two and loving and worshiping your teacher, and whether it's a man or a woman, and they've always been kind and they've taught you wonderful things, and you don't want to move out of grade two. But the problem is, there's other grades, and the and the teachers tell you that uh, you've learned all that I can teach you. You must now go into the next grade level, 
Yeah, it's like the movie Van Wilder. Have you ever seen that with Ryan Reynolds? It's an older movie. It's fun. It's a fun I, movie. It's I, a national. I may have. I, it, it sounds familiar. Yeah, it's like in the same family. It's National Lampoon, so it's silly, you know. But yeah, uh, yeah. basically, the whole premise be, it begins. He uh, doesn't leave college. Like he didn't want to leave because he's stuck there. He's scared to face the world, right? And of course, spoiler yeah, exactly. alert: at the end, he he figures out and it all works out. Well, but religion's it's the, same, the same way. Yeah, good point. Damn, good point. Yeah, you know, and, and I hate to tell uh, people, and if they're Christian, look, I have no problem with whatever religion you believe in. But be the best Christian you are. Be the best Jew. Be the best Muslim. Be the best Buddhist, Zoroastrian, Hindu, whatever. Be the best at your morality, your spirituality, because it all comes from the same source. As a Baha'i, I try to teach that to everybody. Be the best at, at, at your religious belief. No, Don't just jump on the bandwagon and say, well, this is what it is, and I put it in a box, and uh, it, it explains all these uh, things, and, and they explain it in physical terms. Well, what about the spiritual terms? Because it is all religious writings and texts, all holy writings, are teaching things about the spirit of mankind, the spiritual condition of mankind. They're not talking about history. They're not talking about science although there is some aspect of that in there, they're talking about the spiritual condition. And when you start to understand that and you read all the various holy books, you realize it's the same thing over and over and over again every thousand years or so. Why is that? To get it through our heads that we have to grow up and mature. And when we start to do that, we find that the world takes on a whole different uh, appearance, a different attitude, uh, a whole way of thinking, uh, interaction. Uh, we're, we're caught up right now in a world of materialism to, to such a point that whoever has the most gold at the end of their life wins, whatever. What do they win? You can't take it with you. Well, I have the accomplishment that I, I had all the billions of dollars or even trillions of dollars, and uh, I did that all by myself. Good for me, right? <laughs> That's not the point. You missed it. It's like when you're in the womb of the mother, you're developing arms, legs, head, eyes, ears, mouth, nose, et cetera, et cetera, and you have no idea what they're for. Even if you could think, you would not know what they're for. In this physical life, we're going through the same matrix of the womb, but in a physical form where we're now experiencing the things around us, and we're learning those things around us, and we interact with one another. And how we interact and how we display what we call the spiritual qualities or virtues uh, between each other determines our spiritual condition and our progress in the afterlife. Again, if you look at the spectrum, and you got this little sliver of color, the physical light that we're in is like that physical sliver of light. There's a pre-existence, there's an after-existence, but it's a continuum. Life is a continuum. And what appeared before is infinite. What appears in this sliver of physical reality is temporal, very, very finite. What appears after it is infinite. So the reality is life is infinite. And therefore, we must establish and learn during this lifetime, which is 75, maybe 100 years if we're lucky, to learn all that we can and to be good and decent people. That doesn't mean you go out and, and start committing a war against another nation, which is what Russia uh, and uh, have, uh, doing it uh, with uh, Ukraine and any all of the other wars that have happened since then. It doesn't mean that you go out and make so much money that you you create a, a poverty uh, in one portion of society that cannot even feed themselves, cannot even put shelter over themselves. And the only thing they can do is to congregate in, in a, a group on the side of a street and sleep under shelters or, you know, maybe get into stealing or doing drugs and all that shit. Up in Vancouver, that's an epidemic. 
and it's it's the same I know down in the states, but in in Vancouver we got one of the poorest districts right downtown, and it's atrocious, and people are dying left, right, and center from drug overdose and all the rest of it, and you feel sorry for them, and you can only do just so much. It then becomes a point: what can be done, either provincially or nationally to solve this problem. This is a moral problem that's going on, besides a physical problem. So, you know, throughout the books that I write, I bring, I keep refocusing people back onto this aspect of uh, following a moral compass. And by doing that, you're going to move forward. But I also dwell on things like what does – science do about it? What is the military doing about it? What is their agenda? What are they up to? What is the corporate wealthy elite doing? And a lot of what they're like the wealthy corporate elite, there are people in the know who know about extraterrestrial life and they know it's real and they know they're coming here and they're grabbing the technology and they're utilizing it for their own purposes as well as maybe setting up their own military who have these, um, highly advanced um, craft and weaponry and whatever other science that goes with it. And in volume two, I discussed that about the aspect of cloning and hybridization and how long it's been going on. And it's surprising, but cloning has been going on for at least a few thousand years, not in the same manner that we are doing it, and, but you know, it's you been know. happening. I, I want to dive down that with you. We unfortunately, I've, I've got a hard out today. So actually, I've just got one more question for you. And then I'm going to invite you back on because we're definitely going to have to go through this. But guys, in the meantime, check the show notes, of course, all the ways to find him is incredible book series, which I mean, what we're talking about here, there's so much information that you have just laid out for us here and that you and I have been discussing. And this is a fraction of what you cover in your book. So the way that you connect everything together is something I absolutely find so fascinating and respect about you, your work, you and your work. And it's just incredible to see you tie so many topics together and to look at it through such a large lens rather than strictly the this specific one and you were you held there and that you know and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but you have such like like i said just a wide variety of interests that you have that you place into these and it's such an incredible reference it's almost like i can't wait for this to for the technology to be there i guess for this to be in like tablet form like the movie um hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the don't panic book and you can open it <laughs> and you could say something and it would pull up a part of this based on like a you know reference and it would just find it for you real quick and just tell you you know and show the pictures that you have because you have incredible pictures and these things these are i mean textbooks i that that's that's there's no other way to put it i mean they're hundreds of pages each there's textbooks there's six of them they're massive i mean this is what they'll be teaching in the space um space force up in the uh capsule there for all the kids that are born up there They'll have these. And so here, here's something that I definitely wanted to make sure that um, I got your opinion on before we wrap here for this time. But again, I'm definitely going to be inviting you back. Man, there's way too much to cover here. Okay, so we had spoken earlier about uh, the uh, that we're kind of a quarantine species on this planet. Now, one of the most terrifying things to me spiritually is to think of this place as a prison planet, meaning that your soul can die here, go to the Archon moon, you know, the moon trap, and we've all heard about that. It's probably in your book. And uh, you then recycle here until you figure something out. Maybe that's what uh, reincarnation is and all of these things. But what terrifies me is, is that we're stuck because of the representation that we have around us, right? Now, the question I have for you is if there is a galactic federation out there where there seems to be evidence that there's something going on out here where there's multiple different entities or one entity posing as multiple different entities, and to be fair, and uh, perhaps, you know, um, there's some way that we can join that and perhaps some humans in the past have. So the question to you would be, do you think that there's a possibility of what they refer to as a secret space program, but more I refer to as like a breakaway civilization to where it's not a representative of the U.S. government that's out there kicking in doors and uh, flipping over lizard tables. What it is, is it's more of a, uh, a selected group of humans who have just figured it out and gotten their shit together for a better term. And they basically get selected to go. And maybe there's something to that. So that's my question for you. Do you think that 
kind of the fate of all of humanity and what we see in our world, the, the people destroying stuff and the calamity and all of that, it doesn't necessarily represent all of us. And I think that aliens or extraterrestrial non-human intelligences would have some sort of delineation to be able to see that because they interact with us on such a personal and subjective basis. So that's a question, man. What do you think? Breakaway civilization? What do you think? Yeah, I've heard that before, and I kind of figured that out for myself. Um, I know Richard Dolan speaks about this as a breakaway civilization, and um, he may have been the first one to have come out and stated it publicly, but there were a lot of people who were thinking about that situation probably even back in the late 60s, early 70s, and um, because if they were reverse engineering uh, alien technology, particularly from the spacecraft that crashed or was shot down, that they would have made some leaps forward. You also have to understand that humanity is very bright and uh, inventive and uh, able to uh, figure things out for themselves by trial and error. And even before we were, say, being visited by ETs, the, the French had were developing disc-shaped uh, craft, um, though they never flew, although I thought they had one that looked like it was, had a uh, an outer ring that was rotating around very fast. And they said, well, it was just a, a wooden mock-up. And I'm thinking, well, if that's wood, that's pretty amazing, because this thing was going so fast, it's like looking at a record player and having a strobe light and, and adjusting the um, the RPMs on it to get the thing to look like it's standing still, right? Yeah, but yeah. that's, I've got photographs of that. And even the Canadians were, were doing, building dish shaped type craft, the Avro Aero, Aero program Park. and yeah. what they call um, uh, Spark. I think it's S P A S P A R or some Spark, S P A R. That was it. Where they were developing uh, spacecraft that were jet powered, not just the um, that uh, hovercraft type of design, the Avro cars, they said, that was sponsored by the Americans. Um, that was a rudimentary uh, prototype, a proof of concept. And they did work out the bugs on that, by the way. They said it couldn't be stabilized. No, they stabilized that. And you can see it whipping over the, over the terrain. So th that proved uh, that they worked it out. They had other craft that were spade shaped right? And what they thought that was shot down in Roswell, one of these things was spade shape. Was a Canadian built? I don't know. I, I really don't know. But we're looking at a time frame just after in, in the early 50s. By the early 50s, research on electrogravitics and anti-gravitational devices had been figured out. They made the breakthrough. And that meant that now they could build a craft that had no moving parts on it, that basically the turn on the engine, mm -hmm. this thing would come up. And they could hover and do. The thing is, it's like saying, like the old commercials, is it real or is it Memorex? Memorex being that it sounds the same, it must be real, but in fact it was recorded. It's the same thing with the, the craft. It looked like it could do some of the things that extraterrestrial craft could do, but it was man-made. And so the the UAP, which we brought up earlier in the beginning, is man-made secret covert technology. And so what the Navy is engaging in, they don't know that this is their own technology and that it's flying all over the place. And it isn't necessarily piloted by humans. It's piloted by programmable life forms, which again, I speak about this in one of the books. And these are uh, beings that are, for want of a better word, are cybernetic, that they have a computer-like type brain and somebody like they uh, sitting at a control panel as they would control a drone flying over in the air, they could do the same thing with these beings. And that these beings will go out and do all kinds of things, including abduction of humans which now says, oh, what are we dealing with here? Is it ET or is it man 
made. It's a, a programmable life form. So I throw that monkey wrench in there and saying, you know, there's evidence not only for one side, but it's evidence for the other side that these things are programmable. So do we have a breakaway society? Yes, we do. We are at the current stage of development on this planet. We're about a point seven four seven five. We're not even a type one civilization yet. But the secret breakaway society, which is made of, of uh, military intelligence, maybe even some politicians and some wealthy people have uh, been wealthy or supplying the money, and then the scientists are working to create all these things from the alien technology. And the, the whole point here is we're still dealing with nuts and bolts for the most part. And so if you see something flying over and it looks like nuts and bolts, it's probably man-made. If it's flying over and you can't see any steams on it, it looks like a ball of plasma or, or light or fluorescent light, that's probably ET. Why is that? Because it's safe for them to fly in that condition, which is an out-of-phase condition between physical reality and another dimension. And so when they pop through what they call a porthole. It's not a porthole. It's, it is a phasing out of one reality into another reality, which forms what looks like a round ring or a portal. And when that when they go through it, boom, they're gone. The portal collapses. At least the, the area of, of space collapses. When you see it flying there in, in, in uh, the sky, it's not physically there, it's bleeding through. And so we can see a physical outline of that craft. That's interdimensionality. This is the science they're now trying to crack. And they're very close to doing that. Dr. Greer has seen in an underground facility that he had an opportunity to go into medical procedures where they can regrow a severed limb that had been lost during the war or whatever and grow it back to its normal functional use. And he says they're using some form of like, you know what Curlian photography is? Yeah. That is picture of your aura. Pardon me? Oh, they can take a picture of your aura. Mm -hmm. Yeah. An aura. But if you cut a leaf off, Leafs. Yeah, I've you seen can that. still see the other end of the leaf. That's no longer there. Yeah. The energetic it, imprint uh, remains. Right. And, and it's the same with humans. And it's the same with any life form because the energy is still there. And uh, and so you, you then have to start realizing we really are just energy, and we have this physical structure to contain the energy. Uh, and I wouldn't even say contain, but associated. Yeah. It's associated. It's like um, a reflection in the mirror. Uh, we're not in the mirror, but we see the reflection. You break the mirror – has the image uh, di died and, and gone away, or is it still existing, yeah, right? Okay. Is the cat in the box dead or not dead? That's Schrodinger's yes. cat. That's yes, the is, same Terry. premise. So the thing is, once you start to understand that there's a technology involved in this and that um, this society has broken away and developed its own spacecraft using alien technology, has probably gone to the moon, may have set up bases, may have gone to Mars and set up some bases there as well. And it becomes so wild and outlandish. Who do you start believing? Very good has said, I spent 20 years as a, uh, one of these paratroopers or, or covert troopers or, on Mars for 20 years and flying spaceships. And then when I uh, entered, left the, uh, the service, they brainwashed me and I lost all the memory and, and it's only just starting to come back to me. How do you prove that? You haven't got any uh, provable evidence. If he said, go to coordinates such and such in Mars and photograph that area or pick up the photographs that have been taken up there, you'll see the, the base there. Then I would start to believe that. Or uh, I can tell you where the spaceships are out in space and they're off at a certain range and they'll have this shape and configuration. Uh, I've heard these stories where there's four to 5,000 men on board one ship that is like um, uh, an aircraft carrier out in space. And basically they live there and every once in a while they get supplies coming in from Earth to restock the, that ship. 
And that ship is probably about a mile or two in size. That's how large these things are. I've had a remote view where I thought I saw one. And it was a very odd shape. It reminded me of a key uh, with a, uh, a round sort of uh, round at one end and sort of a angled off on, on the other end. Uh, and I saw it momentarily and then it kind of disappeared. I wasn't like I wasn't meant to see it. Yeah, you hear I this. did see it. Yeah, you I hear this. It. It. You're not allowed or you'll get blocked. Area 51, yeah, a lot of people I, are trying I, to remember. I know that. that I've been blocked uh, in some of my remote view. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I'm trying to break through that. And uh, uh, Greer has mentioned that sometimes they'll block you if you're getting too close. I've seen things on one of the moons of uh, Saturn, Iapetus. And Iapetus is a funny-looking moon. It has a large ridge that runs equatorial, and it has light and dark, and it has actual geometric form. It's a, a polygon. And one thing they didn't tell you that has a tower on the southern hemisphere and i remote viewed that eight years before cassini found it who built the tower yeah hang on, hang on a sec i, I just want to block that um so the uh that's what remote viewing can do i saw into the future and i saw at a distance and i saw the nasa photograph that confirmed what i saw so the thing is, we're, we're entering an amazing time where if consciousness is developed into a science, we're going to be incredibly different types of human being on this surface. Um, we have to develop a hive mentality because the ants and the bees have it and the birds have it and other animals have it. Humans don't have that yet. We are not able to function as a unit. Do you think like we could bird. retain that without a hive mentality and retain our independence? Yes, yes, we can. That, but it's like saying we'll all be on the same page. Right. We may be one person may be reading at the top of the page, another person in the middle, and another person at the bottom of the page, but we're all on the same page. But like everyone uh, has yeah. a clear definition of cruelty and what that means, and we're all not on board with it. Yeah, that. and and we under have we have an understanding of war and the damage it does to us, right. both physically and after the aftermath of it all the thing is when you get into a type one civilization which is where you get these incredible technologies that are uh, traveling at the speed of light or faster being able to manipulate your environment to such a degree that you create something that perhaps wasn't meant or hasn't been seen before for the first time uh, incredible breakthroughs in, in medicine breakthroughs in uh, archaeological understanding, where we came from, uh, understanding the different bi uh, bioforms of life that, that is out in space and now is starting to show up. Uh, I've had contact with different types of ET. I actually have ETs that show up in the house and hang around here for a little while and then they take off. Uh, and they're like a ball of light. And uh, my wife has seen it. Uh, I've seen it. I've got my backyard camera who re that records some of this stuff where it comes right out through the wall and goes around the backyard and comes back towards the house. Um, all kinds of things. Why is that? Because they know that this is a safe home. And I told them, this is a safe place. If you want to come here, you can come here. And uh, you can spend whatever amount of time. What I would like is the opportunity to communicate with you. I don't want anything from you. I just want your time, your communication. You're like, let's just have a chat, guys, you know, and you're welcome to come hang out because obviously, you know, you're going to do it either way. But uh, it's it's fascinating, man. Your your perspective is so interesting and I love it. I love your work. I, I because just... it's not the usual perspective that most ufologists have. My books give you the big picture, not the little picture, the big picture. Yeah, and all of it, guys. A citizen's disclosure on UFOs and ETI are going to be located at, down in the show notes. Make sure that you guys check this link. Uh, I'm going to throw your Facebook in there as well. And you guys reach out because uh, Terry obviously has some fascinating things to say. And um, I just can't wait to hear more from you, man. That's, this is how thick it is. Jesus. See, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's a that's great— 840 pages and that's one one of the six volumes it's fascinating that's guys it. they're back there they take up the whole shelf practically so uh terry tubano I, I can't thank you enough man this has been 
absolutely incredible. Like there, there is so many more things that we're going to talk about. And so let's, let's do this. I'm going to invite you back very soon. We'll do a quick turnaround on this and man, I'm super pumped because this has been incredible. So Terry, I can't thank you enough. You're invited back of course, brother. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're very welcome. And just before we uh, depart, uh, my books are only available online. That means that you would go to your favorite bookstore, whether it's Barnes and Noble, Amazon, if, or others like Hudson in the States, or if you're in Canada, it would be Chapters on Indigo. And basically, uh, you go online, you look for the, the title, A Citizen's Disclosure on UFOs and ETI, and you should see all six volumes. And what you can do, they are expensive. They're like a university textbook. Each book, the first one in particular, is like getting three books in one. That's how voluminous this uh, writing is. And there's six books like that. And full of pictures, references. You can see where I got the information from. And uh, you, you're going to pay a little bit more than you normally would. But I guarantee you, once you have this, and I've had people down in the States who bought this book, I've had uh, one fellow who said, this is a tool to force. I've never seen anything like this. He says, you should be teaching this in university. I've approached the universities. And they said, it's so massive. We don't know where to even begin and who would teach it. I said, I'll teach it. <laughs> yeah, you have the curriculum. You have the professor. He wrote the book. I mean, all professors write their own textbooks, right? But I mean, exactly. and you've done it. That's what's cool. You may have paid it forward on that or you went ahead and wrote the book. It's one of those, if you build it, they will come kind of thing. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, I sold them in the States. I sold them in Canada. I sold them in Britain. I sold some in Germany. Uh, I sent one to Japan and one down to Israel. I'm trying to get it out. Even if I don't make any money whatsoever, I want the information out there because uh, one of the things we didn't touch on, and I'll just say this very quickly, there is so much error in the UFO database that it has to be corrected. And I may mean tossing some of the information out altogether because it's rather spacious or specious. And uh, that's what I discovered. I had to toss out some of my old thinking based on what I had traditionally known and learned about and realized when I delved into it, this was not the information I was getting from it. The name of the game here. We do that every single episode. And you've helped a lot of people do that with this information today. So thank you again, my friend. This is incredible. Brandon, it's my pleasure. And I look forward to uh, doing this again with you. I want to send a huge shout out to that man responsible for that massive volume of absolutely incredible information, uh, Terry T. Bondo. Dude, you're welcome back anytime. We got so many more things to talk about, so you will be invited back very shortly. Uh, check out a citizen's disclosure on UFOs and ETI. That link is located down in the show notes so that you guys can check out this amazing compendium of information. And thank you again, Terry. That's outstanding. Now, while you guys are down in the show notes, check out our affiliate links as well. We have Food Forest Abundance. Get your freedom from fear on. We have Opus, the organization for paranormal understanding and support. Now, also, if you want to start your own podcast, there's a link down there that reads, start your own podcast. We partner with Red Circle, and that's highly what I recommend you to do. That's the that's link that'll get you going there. Also, uh, while you're down there, if you want to step your game up in general, take Dewey Taylor up on his offer over there at the Manifestor's Guide. Type Expanding Reality, all caps, new spaces at checkout, and he even sweetens the deal on top of that. Now, also, while you guys are down in the show notes, check our mothership. This is where everything's at, and that is ExpandingRealityPodcast.com. It's where it's all happening. That's also the same place that you can sign up to become an expansive insider and support the show while also taking advantage of all the bonus content going on over there, and it's going off. Also, this is a value for value system. So if you guys find this valuable, we always encourage everyone to check the link down there that reads support the mission. And that is how you can support your favorite show in one of the most important ways that it can be done. We do live in a 3D reality where shit like that's got to go down. That's how you do it. And I'm absolutely grateful for everyone for participating in that. It means way, way more than you know. So guys, uh, go out into this incredibly beautiful place and y'all pick up a piece of litter. You know, be open-minded, uh, be nice to everybody that you come across. Let's find some new ideas out there and entertain them for more than a, nah, fuck that. You know, give it that breath. Give it that, hmm, 
let's uh, you know let's see what's going on here maybe uh, and then also while you're doing all of that stuff all of that can be contemplated in the not left hand lane if that's where you'd prefer to drive if you've got someone behind you that would like to get there a little quicker just move on over contemplate those things off to the side and then they'll be right by you and that is how you raise the vibe absolutely 100 percent especially for that person behind you but above all and anything else go out into this beautiful place guys whatever the hell this thing is and y'all be good to one another thank you so much for watching for listening engaging and all of that we'll see you next time